You are listening to Bronze Bites' second season, I suppose we'll call this. Uh, we are back. Uh, Bree is with me, and uh, the Browns are getting going in at the Greenbrier. Uh, we were not invited. Uh, we're still bitter. Uh, but we've sort of had five weeks off. Now the Browns are going, so we're back at it. Bree, what did you do with your five-week summer vacation? Oh, Pete, I did a lot of baseball, a lot of softball. Went on an actual vacation, which was great. Worked a lot because I had a deadline in the middle of June. So that was really fun. I got a swimming pool. Yes. And, and a haircut. Yes, it would look, <laughs> look great. That was a lot in five weeks. So yeah, and uh, and we're, we are working on feeling good about the swimming pool. Working on feeling great about it. It was a two-year in the works situation. So uh, we were still in the pandemic at that time, kind of. So it was a it was a luxury. I realized that. I acknowledge that. Look at, look at stop. Look at you. You can't help yourself. Already being defensive. Let's put this into context. So, um, what? Meanwhile, she's doing all this, and I see this picture of her in the pool. I'm just like, what am I doing with my life? As I'm chasing around high school kids in the <laughs> beating hot sun for the past five weeks or several weeks, and then uh, two days this week, and then last week. We were at Walsh University for an overnight, which was um, work, but Walsh University was awesome. Like the dorms are spectacular and all that. Um, And then went to the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which is really nice because Joe Thomas's stuff is up. His little placard thing is up, even though his bust is not in there. So that was a lot of fun. But yes, as I uh, we were scheduling to to record this, I said, you know, I had. We had two days. We started two days this week. It's the way the calendar has changed in high school football. Um, but Tuesday and then Wednesday, we had two day practices, and then we followed that up with our youth camp in the evening. So, and that's in addition to the stuff I'm trying to do with my normal job. So that is the closest I will get to a typical life, a typical day in the life of one Bree. So, uh, as Welcome far as the the madness, sw- as far as the swimming pool is concerned, I would say it's well deserved. Um, Thank you. Anyway, the Browns, I guess they're doing stuff. I guess we should talk about it. So I'm curious when we got out of the OTAs and stuff uh, versus now, I'm curious if the 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 break away from it has affected our excitement level with where we are with this team. For me, yes and no. But I feel like it's not necessarily about the actual team and what's been going on. It's more so the fact of. I get very excited for football season to start like when we hit August and I I realized that we are almost there. We're almost at August, but with that comes school and back to school um, anxieties. So for me, like I want to relish these next couple of weeks before school starts. Uh, But I am looking forward to the preseason games. I have to say Uh, I'm looking forward to actually seeing football being played again Um, I like this time of year where, you know, the days are long, the nights start to become more comfortable and you can put football on it pretty much almost every night of the week again, uh, come mid to late August with college football as well. So I'm still about the same level, Pete. Um, I think I'll get there once there's actual games being played, albeit just preseason ones. Yeah. So like you sort of get excited for training camp and then you have to remind yourself that one, they don't have pads on. And then two, it's kind of boring. The Browns themselves specifically seem to have basically with their trip to the Green Bar, basically just said, okay, we're going to take our, what would have been our, our, our last week of OTAs and just move them to this first week. So it's very low key. They've done a couple walkthroughs. They've done some very light practices, though. I think they're supposed to put pads on tomorrow, the, tomorrow being Friday. We're recording this on a Thursday. Um, but it's been like, it has not been like the all out football you think of it. So you're like, oh man, I'm ready for training camp. And you're like, oh, wait a minute. It's sort of very, we're not quite there yet. We still need to get to that point where, you know, it's real football, especially with blocking and tackling and all that stuff. But so right now it's been a bunch of running around and throwing highlights, which is great. I think the thing I've noticed so far right now is, you know, beyond the fact that Everybody feels great. Everybody's in the best shape of their life. Everybody's ready to break out. Everybody feels (laughs) like this. The vibe is right where it's supposed to be and all that. The one thing I do notice is how Deshaun Watson is talking. And obviously there's a lot with him. 
Uh, I don't know, Bree, how much you got to see from his press his press conference. Um, I think there were some good things. I think there was one little moment where I think he did not do himself any favors. I did see that one. How could you avoid that one? Yeah. Uh, so, like, I, I you contrast how he talked last year, and you and I have talked about this. He's a good press conference. He gives you a lot of insight to how he really feels. So, like. Last year, he was, yes, he was positive, but he was always talking, he was always sort of task oriented. He was always sort of like talking about the things he wanted to to do, how he wanted to get ready and all these things, trying to get comfortable, trying to, you know, figure out his role, all these things. You're hearing him talk more like a guy who feels comfortable in his role. You feel confident. He feels confident in what he's doing. I think if you base it off that, I think. You know, we're, everybody, including notably you, are worried that what if Deshaun Watson's just broken? Um, just listening to him talk, I think he sounds a lot more comfortable with with himself. I think he feels a lot more confident. I think he feels like he's much more prepared than he was last year. That's what I feel like is really hard to gauge, though, at this point in time, because of what you mentioned. They're not in pads. They're not going at full speed for the most part. Mm-hmm. And I joke about this all the time, like same thing with OTAs, but social media will put out clips of Deshaun throwing passes, albeit they're they're great passes. Uh, There's no pressure in his face. There's no one running at him 100 miles per hour. There's 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 just no fear of getting hit. So in my mind, of course, this should look smooth. It should look good. It should look 100 percent. So I still do have that fear um, going into the season that until we see it, in an actual game that counts, I, I still am just a little bit uncertain about it. And he did talk about it in the press conference too, of, you know, the impact that the whole off season had on him. And obviously he was away from the team for a period of time. Um, What I find confusing about the whole, like that whole conversation, I know we're probably not going to talk about it is he, he, he has stood pretty firm about like, not doing anything wrong, right? He 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 has he has refuted all of the everything for the most part. What I find interesting though is when the team speaks about him, Kevin Stefanski, even ownership, they talk about how far he's come. Yeah. So it, it there's just a weird like they're they're definitely not on the same page in terms of like I think Deshaun's interpretation is if he admits any type of growth and or like says anything along those lines, then he's automatically guilty. So that's what I find interesting about listening to him speak versus ownership and the coaching stuff. Like again, there's nothing wrong with admitting therapy and working through talking about things and growing as a person mentally, et cetera. Um, but I feel like any, it, it, I feel like in his mind, that is an, it is an admission of guilt. So uh, that, that whole situation was interesting. There's no question that that's his mindset. Like he is anything that even suggests weakness on that. He, it, it, it comes across to, it, it seemingly in his mind that like guilt, or he's just, built up this sort of internal wall that just suggests yeah nothing's getting through he did he, he is willing to he is willing to say that therapy is useful he is willing to say that he likes uh he benefits from having that person just talk things out like that part that's the one part i will give him a little bit and go yeah like great but yes when ownership tells me that he's doing great it means nothing to me because right because i heard them say the same things Last year, year. that doesn't mean they're wrong. It just, it just feels like you're, you're, you're trying to will it into existence a little bit Um, that they, they, they desperately want you to believe it. Now the, the thing where I get sort of tripped up is when it becomes my ordeal. That's not, that's not going to help you because, you know, if if you're somebody who, if you're somebody who believes he did nothing wrong, then that's probably how you, you, you see it. It is his ordeal. If you are, 90% 90% of everybody else you're sitting there going probably somebody else's ordeal. But that's the part where you sort of look at it and go, Ugh. but nevertheless, I, I I think he's talking in a way that is more forward looking, feeling good about what's happening and moving on. And I, and to your point, I think teammates talk him with a certain level of reverence. 
you make of that what you will. It's it's because I, I again I'm sort of one foot in each bucket. Like I want him to be the leader, and at the same time I'm sort of like, Neh. but but to your point, yeah, pads. I want pads. I I, I, I uh, the throws, all those clips, they're great. But show me pads because it because it's not football yet. Um, it's nice. It, granted, I want them to get work. That's part of why I'm I'm fine with the idea of like I don't need them to go like kill themselves for hours and hours and hours until you know it's working with a purpose like with that where you're going to get better because you're doing those things like that's that's great um and that's when it's going to matter when are we going to actually see things when is the depth chart really going to change when are those matchups and and things going to get going those parts i think are what we're waiting on so it's like yeah i mean yeah i'm I like i like seeing this stuff i like you know i i'm glad we're talking football i gl- i'm glad we're we're there i'm glad we are at the Greenbrier and not randomly, you know, on tape grabbing a woman by the throat and mm. just awful the situation with Perry and Winfrey. I don't want to drag too much on this, but uh, the thing that bothers me most, one, let's say I'm not surprised at all. I'm just not like right. his track record to this point was dysfunction. And in and, and his rookie year, it was just unreliable, unprofessional. And then he got the arrest earlier this off season and it, it went from unprofessional to violent and very problematic. And to me, one, I'm not surprised Two, I think it looks bad on the team. I think they should have just, it should have been over at that point. And I get it. You're sitting there going, there's somebody sitting there going, well, innocent proven guilty. We don't have it. And all, you know, may, maybe there was a, a disagreement, whatever there were witnesses. It was not a good situation. And then you you get the diversion program to like get out of it, and you're sort of like, all right. But then, broad daylight on camera and all this like just looks awful. I hope for Perion's sake, he figures out like this is the wake up call he needs to figure out his life because this is where it could go very bad uh, from here. It, it may cost him. His, he he will be lucky if it just costs him his NFL career. I hope it doesn't get more to that. But like you allow this to just make your organization look awful because his name is attached or the Browns name is attached while you're doing this. Just can't have it. Right. And given the light of the Browns recent track record, because they've faced a lot of scrutiny over the last year and a half, having another player be in the the spotlight for a negative situation, actually multiple negative situations, because he obviously continued to do things that he shouldn't be doing. Uh, He was given multiple chances uh, throughout the season last year, spring of this year. And then obviously this was the final straw, although interesting that the final straw wasn't in the spring. Um, But again, unfortunately for Perrion, he's not good enough to be able to have these off field issues and act this way and to stay on an NFL team at this point. Like, it's unfortunate that that's where the NFL has gotten to, but there are teams that are clearly willing to take a chance on players that are really good that have struggles or at least positions that are meaningful and can change the entire season or outlook of a franchise. So unfortunately for Perion, he just doesn't have that track record on the field to be able to keep a problem around. Yeah, and that's unfortunately the reality, whether it's sports, music, most anything, celebrity, yeah. the best way Being to a professional. rehab your image is to be talented. It, Agreed. It, not make yeah. no personal growth at all. Just be really good at what you are, and people will find a way to sort of get, deal with it. And unfortunately, that's the reality we're living in with this team to some point. Um, so, yeah, it's – I wish they would have Do- done it earlier. I wish we, they would have moved on and addressed the position uh, and just said, we're not doing this if, if, if for no other reason. What did we talk about all off season and sort of last season is like, we want adults on this team. Like, yes, that was a reason enough in the spring for me to say like, and his rookie year is just, he's not an adult. We dealt with this for the last year. It was a mess. You want an adult football team, just move on. And you can use this to make an example if you want, but it shouldn't have gotten to this point. Yeah, I will I will say, Pete, just like one last point on that. What makes me sad though about the situation is 
Like I recognize that he's still really young and football has probably always been like the distraction that he needs to, to be able to stay out of trouble. Obviously he wasn't able to stay out of trouble while being employed by a professional football team. But I always go back to the whole, like when these players that have these troubling pasts or can't seem to get on the straight and narrow by not having them be part of that team and having access to all the different support systems that teams in the NFL has in place, it does like worry me for him personally, like what, you know, what is going to happen? Because I don't wish that on anyone. Like, you know, there, there are things much bigger than football and it's unfortunate that this happened while he was part of the team that we root for. But, you know, I I do hope, like you said, this is a wake up call and he can figure things out. Now the Browns do have somewhat of a track record ownership since the Haslam took over of sort of being, be, being willing to continue to be a resource for some of these people. I mean, they like, I think they still help Josh Gordon. Like they're still willing Good. to sort of, I like that. Uh, help him. I, I would, I would assume that Malik McDowell is still somebody that like they offer resources to. So like, yeah, to your point, I, I think that is a good thing. And ultimately I think it's sort of your responsibility. If you, if you, you know, you're willing to take these bets, then don't like, try to wash your hands of it entirely and just be like, well, you're on your own type thing. Uh, so yeah, I hope, I hope for their sake, they continue to do that. Uh, obviously he needs to figure it out because otherwise it could go very badly for him very fast. And then we're suddenly, you know, whether it's an arrest or God forbid, an obituary. And then we're sitting going, why, why, why was this allowed to take place? What, you know, beyond pads, you know, what are we looking forward to seeing from training camp? And obviously the other thing that's coming up pretty quick Hall of Fame game next week. My gosh, that's next week. Next week's August, huh? We're there. Next week, next end of next week, Hall of Fame game. Uh, yeah, that's exciting. Uh, I will say, I know that there's been a lot of hype around uh, Elijah Moore <laughs> yes. over the last couple of weeks. And you know me, I love a good wide receiver story. Um, love me some Amari Cooper. I know he's been injured and he hasn't been participating, but I am looking forward to seeing Elijah Moore in uniform. I don't know how much they're going to utilize their starters for these preseason games. I can't imagine much, but um, just listening to him talk and kind of seeing some of the clips and his route running kind of come to fruition and hearing some of the defensive players talk about him. um, I feel like he is everything that I expected OBJ to be in a Browns uniform. So I hope that that is something that actually comes to life this season and we get that dynamic playmaker that can make plays all over the place. You can line them up anywhere and he becomes that type of threat that the Browns desperately need. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Elijah Moore is a guy I love coming out of college. Uh, I, I am a, you know, I'm a big fan of prospects that come out of Lane Kiffin's offense, uh, whether it was Florida Atlantic with Harrison Bryant or now uh, Ole Miss where Elijah Moore went because when Lane Kiffin runs an offense, he will find every single possible way to get his playmakers the ball. Uh, so you'll see them do everything, line up all kinds of weird places. You'll get a sense of their ability to sort of, you know, how how smart are they? Can they do all these things? And Elijah Moore was a guy who just crushed it constantly, as, as did Harrison Bryant. And then he gets to the NFL and you're just sort of like wondering what's going on with the Jets. And then the Browns obviously acquire him. And, and to this point, it's been a lot of, Social media team hype and seemingly Browns organization hype. It's nice to hear that is now Greg Newsom saying, no, he's really, really good. Uh, Greg Newsom, who also changed his number to zero. Yes. Uh, so, which a lot of people were hoping Elijah Moore would take too, which is interesting. But yeah, I mean, just you're now hearing it from other players that are like excited about what he can do and how how good he is and how much he's pushing guys and his work ethic is ridiculous. Uh, again, I, I think if not for the fact that football could is not sentient and had feelings, this would be on the verge of murder suicide type level of obsession with football with him. Or <laughs> if football said no, it might end very badly. I like you listen to Elijah Moore talk, or you you watched his like his Browns sort of uh, the their their whatever videos the, those little clips uh, they do. I think Elijah Moore will. Play football until every league kicks him out of it, and then he will coach until he's not allowed to do it anymore. He just his mindset and just how much he loves, uh, how passionate he is about this game is nuts. 
Um, so I'm, I'm excited for him. I, I hope it works out for him because it just seemed like so much of what didn't work out with the Jets and this perception that he was like a, a malcontent and complainer was just he worked so hard that to then not get the ball was just unacceptable for him. So, uh, you know, that could be great. It, the, the fact that this is one of those things where a change of scenery could be exactly what he needs because the Browns are saying, no, we want to get you the ball. And they've done everything with him. They put him in the backfield. They'll put him all over the field. And I'll do all these great things. So, yeah, I mean, I'm excited for him. And I think he does add a very important element to the offense. Um, he's going to play in the slot. He's going to play outside. Uh, and just he's really, really fast. The only thing that sort of hurts him a little bit is he's just he he doesn't have a a big frame and he's got relatively short arms. So it makes it a little bit of a small target, but he's electric with the ball in his hands. So, yeah, he just adds more, adds more to this offense gives, you know, you, you had with Jacoby Brissett at quarterback, you had a great year from Amari Cooper. You had a good year from Donovan Peoples Jones. You had a good slash great year from David Njoku. And you just add this extra element in addition to Sean Watson. If, if they just play average, all, all those guys play <laughs> average relative to their abilities, like the Browns offense should be better. Uh, I think the Greg Newsom element is very interesting to me. He's had an obviously an eventful offseason. Getting robbed at gunpoint, uh, is, or getting robbed, I think that was a clarification, he was, was not in the car at the time. Uh, getting robbed uh, is is no small deal. And Unfortunately, like I know this happened where three players were robbed and everybody's going, well, this is just a Cleveland thing. It, it's been like all over the place uh, where athletes have been getting uh, robbed. I know there were several Pittsburgh players, uh, Philadelphia players of uh, various sports. Um, you know, poverty sucks. So, yeah, I mean, there's just this element of the, the scary life situation. Greg Newsom trying to come into year three. Very excited about what he can do. Obviously, he had some offseason season whatever you want to call it shenanigans a little bit with sort of what he was doing with his agent and like, did he want to trade? Did he not want to trade? And then he talked to Jim Schwartz allegedly and feels really good about it. Like I, I to me, I, I, I wrote something about this for, for uh, you know, a 32 team thing. I, I know a lot of people are picking Elijah Moore to be a breakout player. And I think the fact that the Browns have a ton of guys you can pick for that is an indication that things are going well. The bad news with that is, the other teams that all have guys uh, like several players that could be breakout players, the Bengals, the Steelers and the Ravens, like we can't, you know, sort of have our own thing, but nevertheless, like Greg Newsom was my guy. Um, I, I just think with his comfort level, getting more comfortable in the slot, getting in a more, uh, a more man heavy scheme is going to be very, very good for him. That's all he wants to do. He's very good at it. Uh, I think he's in position to make huge strides and that, and obviously uh, everybody will focus on that number zero because that's his career interceptions at this point. I think he will be able to make those plays, but I just think the Browns with those corners and, and the safeties that they've added are going to be really in good shape on the back end. But the thing I'm looking forward to most when the pads come on is just the defensive line. It's all about, yes, Miles Garrett's phenomenal. I, I think he's going to have, he's in position to have the best season of his career. Um, and I believe that in no small part because they got Zadarius Smith, because they got uh, Obo Okoronkwo, because uh, because they got Dalvin Tomlinson, and I still like another guy. But just all these things being added, Alex Wright hopefully taking a big step uh, in his second year, and some of these other guys coming in. I, I I've I, I laid out my reasons why I think he could have a tw- he could get past twenty sacks this year. Just because all those guys are really good, and the more talent you have, the more ability it's going, the more difficulty it's going to be to uh, single Miles Garrett to put. You know, he would there, there. You know, there club. You can find clips for floating around on Twitter where he's be, be legitimately beating triple teams. Um, they can't do that with all these other guys in the field. So that's the thing I'm most excited about with this group because obviously, uh, given what we had last year where they were so bad, other than Miles Garrett who still had a. Uh, one of you know his tied his career high in sacks with 16 despite the shoulder injury and despite the level of incompetence uh, around him was just unbelievable on a different level so now you add all this talent you add Jim Schwartz you're hoping that's going to have an impact i can't wait to see that play out i can't wait to see how they mess with the offensive line in training camp and then the preseason i, I don't expect to start in fact if miles garrett sets foot on the field in preseason, I think Kevin Stefanski can be fired. 
I would fire him at that point. Uh, but yeah, I, I just, I cannot wait for that. I think 20 sacks is in the range for him. Just everything's all there for it. So I cannot wait for that group to get going. I agree with you. I think just defense overall with Jim Schwartz and, and upgrading what we think is an upgraded coach. Um, it seems like the players, they sound rejuvenated. I know that's obviously this time of year that we mentioned where everyone is excited. It's like getting back to school, essentially, where you're like very excited for the beginning and uh, to start. And then as everything obviously wears on, then it becomes like less shiny and new. Um, but I, I think a lot of the players that are speaking, they they do seem to just sound more genuine, um, more authentic, a little bit more open about things, maybe even not fully like obvious when they're talking about it, but some like just passive aggressive things, maybe a little bit. <laughs> what are you laughing at? I just, the, the idea that the passive aggressive, I mean, that, that it, it probably not wrong, but at the same time, you know what that reminds me of? It's just every time I hear that is I just think LeBron James, <laughs> the ultimate passive aggressive fair in press conferences. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, but, but no, I, I am excited to see the defense, especially because, you know, the defense was for the most part, pretty young last year too. Um, yeah, no question. There's a, there's a lot of new faces. There's a lot of talk about leadership, Miles Garrett specifically. And he answered some of those questions as well. And I have no doubts in Miles Garrett being a leader of the defense. And, uh, you know, I'm just anxious to kind of see how it all comes together. And I hope that it is something that comes together quickly and it isn't a like slow it's not going to be this like we're going to build into it like i hope it just immediately clicks what was your reaction to that not only obviously the, the it being brought up but I, I did you see miles garrett sort of talk about that or some of the other players talk about that in terms of leadership and everything else because uh my immediate thought uh, that's why i'm curious my immediate thought is like i think you know, everybody has their sort of preferred taste in leadership. And I right. think in some ways it's as simple as there are people who can appreciate how guys do it. Like Nick Chubb, for example, is a big lead by example guy. But, you know, if you're saying I really, really want a vocal leader, then maybe that's not what he is, but that doesn't right. mean he's not leading. It's just maybe not to your taste. Yeah. Agreed. And we, we've talked about this before with Miles, but like he's such a big guy to not have him be this like loud mouth, aggressive um, in your face leader that we can tangibly see. That's where I think he gets criticized the most, which which is so silly, because to your point, there's just so many different types of leaders and so many different ways to lead. There's not a right or wrong way. It truly is just a preference. And again, I think it's silly that he gets the criticism, like as much criticism as he does. Uh, but I, I have like no doubts that he is a really good leader and that he has a ton of respect from his teammates. My hope in that situation is, is he's, he sort of looks at it and goes, I'm doing my thing, but like take something that Malik Jackson says and goes, okay. And maybe I need to do something, you know, a little bit more, or it's just kind of, I would hope that his mindset, because he he seems like a big growth mindset guy, is to be like, okay, maybe I need to to work on this a little bit more to continue to evolve. It doesn't mean he needs to like completely change who he is or anything, but just sort of push his envelope a little bit more in terms of trying to be able to cater to more guys. I've always had this impression that he's sort of erudite in some ways that I think he has. I don't think he has a ton of patience for guys who are. Or, or basically dipshits. I, I yeah. think, mm -hmm. I, I, I think once, you know, I think he really gravitates towards guys who see football. And I think in some ways life, the same way he does, where if you're pat, you know, if you're going to do it, be passionate about it. And that's why I think he and JOK are very close. Like JOK has that very outgoing, you know, very focused on what he wants to do with, with football, with life and sort of those things. I think that's sort of how he works. Where I think Miles Garrett's going to give you a chance, get, potentially give you several chances. But after a while, he's sort of like, I'm moving on. I'm going to focus on the guys who sort of get what we're doing here or get what I'm doing and focus more my time on them. I think that's why he and Larry Ogunjobi were so close. Larry Ogunjobi's stupidly smart. I mean, you know, I remember joking back when 
those guys were together, the like the Browns had like the Mensa defensive line because they just had a bunch of brilliant people on there. I think he's really drawn to those people. I don't think he has t- patience for like guys who just either don't get it or or don't put forth the effort that he thinks is necessary. Now, maybe you want to criticize and say, well, you need you might want to do more to sort of get more guys to come to your level, but. I sort of get it to a certain point at some point, especially in pro football, you, you need guys to be adults and, and sort of be able to figure out what you're really doing here. So I hope he continues to work and to, continues to evolve. I, I, I thought he was a little more defensive than I would like him to be in that way. He was sort of like, well, that's his opinion type thing. I was just sort of hoping a little bit more of, yeah, I mean, maybe I, maybe I want to say it better way than I'm saying it, but find a better way to sort of figure out to sort of, cater to more people but like i'm absolutely here for guys who who need me and all these other things because i think there's a lot of that i think that's part of why they got some of the guys they've got is they've got people who have that same mindset like you know we we talked about this and sort of joked that like people are like mad at Juan thornhill for being the super positive guy obo okoronko is the same deal man like you if you follow his twitter they're like I saw a tweet just before we started recording. He's like, if you woke up today, this is your fresh start. Like he's that type of dude. It's awesome that, you know, you have all these guys. So I think that's part of the things that's going to help is that they've got more of these people who are just like super motivated, super focused. So I, you know, I I think miles is perfectly fine. Like, and, and I keep coming back to this thought of like, if all else fails and miles is not some great leader, the Browns will have to settle for the fact that he's the greatest pass rusher in the team's history. He's the best defensive end of his generation, and he's probably going to retire as the best guy ever to wear 95 in the NFL. He's coming for you, Richard Dent. He's coming. Are we really going to be that? Like, this is one of those things where I, I feel like, and, I, and I, we've talked about this, but I, it's like before LeBron went to Miami, There's all, before he left and then came back, like, there was this change. Before he left, the, LeBron was never doing quite enough. There was always, he was never quite enough, whether it was, he was, you know, he wasn't taking the big shot at the end of the game, or he wasn't deferring the right shot at the end of the game, or he wasn't doing enough to recruit guys to Cleveland, or, you know, he wasn't doing enough in 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 a, in a big game, and then he left and he came back, and suddenly everybody's like, "Love LeBron, no matter what, doing a great job." I'm not going to say a thing because we don't want him to leave again. Uh, I hope we don't get into the, because I think it's already happening with Miles Garrett. He's he's unbelievable at this sport and he's a phenomenal human being obviously outside of the the one incident he had uh with the helmet but like at some point you just sort of have to accept that like he is everything we could want from what the pick and everything we could want from him as a player and we got to get out get over it and sort of be like focus on some of these other guys that aren't quite as good unless unless we he's legitimately doing something wrong but his last season alone should get everybody off of him, save for the the car. Just, just outstanding football player. Uh, career year in, in that garbage defense. Yeah, agreed. We just need to be happy. We need to be happy with what we have. We got to stop complaining. Right. The, the obviously the the first week of training camp, the Perry and Winfrey thing happens right before they leave. I still have a big question about defensive tackle. I keep hoping they're going to sign another starter. I don't think they're going to sign anybody and and they haven't so far this is, but my thought beforehand was once they go to the green bar they're not doing it they're not bringing somebody in they're not going to be like hey by the way we're cutting you to bring in another guy to go to this which would be god that would suck if you're like at this phenomenal resort they're like pack pack your shit uh we're cutting you but i also think that sort of you're trying to sell this idea that you're team building and you're trying to like grow these bonds with your teammates and just be like trying not to remind them of the harsh business side of this. Uh, I think they weren't going to do that, but once they come out defensive tackle, I'm still looking at and the other one. The the other question I have is running back. Are they going to bring in somebody else? Obviously Nick Chubb is that guy, that dude after him. I know they're super excited about Jerome Ford. I, it's fascinating listening to Nick Chubb talk about Jerome Ford. He's very high on Jerome Ford, but who else is going to do it? Uh, there's talk of Demetric Felton. Uh, obviously they've got uh, some undrafted dudes. They got the kid from Georgia Tech who I'm kind of interested in, in, but are they going to bring in somebody else? Are they going to sort of wait this one out? We'll see. Uh, so, 
I don't know if there's any other positions that sort of jump out to you, but those are the big two that I sort of are we are we good with this? Are we gonna are we gonna go with what we have or are we gonna bring in some more help? Yeah, I would I would agree with you there. I feel like too, like what seems like people are continuing to bring up, and maybe this was just exasperated by Amari Cooper's injury or tweak at training camp, but I still feel like people are questioning the wide receiver room and do we have the right group there? Um, And to be honest, Pete, I'm going to say something. I saw a clip yesterday and I completely forgot David Bell was even on the team. Yeah, that's, but here's the thing, like you, you laugh and you're like, it probably sounds cold to you because you care about people. Um, (laughs) But here's the thing, like that's the mark of a good football team that like, or, you know, what you hope is a good football team that like, a second year player, you're not sitting there like we have in future years past. We're sitting there going, he has to be really good or we're screwed. Like they have enough talent where they can say, David Bell, go on your schedule. And, you know, hopefully you're going to be good enough to, to, to impact the game. I think he will play. I think he will contribute. But like we're not in a situation where we're sitting there and we just sit there harping on draft picks and going, oh, my God, if this doesn't work out, like. What are we going to do? Because they've got enough guys. They've got enough guys to keep you excited. Though this does remind me of a certain commentator uh, whose initials are GB, who who suggested that if both Amari Cooper and Elijah Moore go down with injury, the Browns are really going to be hurting at one receiver. It's like that is every team in the NFL. <laughs> True. Uh, I, I want to be in a situation where where you're sitting there not going, this young player has to step up. And certainly Jerome Ford is an, has an opportunity. But I mean – like if Jerome Ford were to go down with injury, it's not the end of the world. Certainly, knock on wood, that doesn't happen, given that we're recording this after Joe Burrow went down with an undisclosed calf injury and, and Jalen Ramsey of the Dolphins went down with the undisclosed injury. You know, you want your guys to stay healthy, but like we don't want these guys to have to be on the field unless they've sort of earned it, uh, which is, I think, something that has been very alien to this team really since 1999. Like, This is the David Bell example is how functional teams operate. Um, You know, how many years were we sitting there, you know, with with the Pittsburgh Steelers and you'd forget about draft picks until they showed up year three and year four. And then we're really good. And you're like, oh, my God, they got another guy. Like, let's, you know, that's that's how it should go. Yeah. I mean, again, like there's still an entire another month of training camp and preseason games to go through and like knock on wood because like the injury bugs as you mentioned seems to be happening today but that's always again like another worry (laughs) for me of like you just you just never know right like you can we can sit here and say like these are all the needs that that we have but again like there's probably going to be some other things that pop up unexpected that you have to figure out and that will become an even bigger priority yeah because like we're sitting here july 27th the regular season doesn't start till what a week in, if not two weeks, in September you know, tenth, week I think. September. Right? Yeah, it's so like it's a long time. Ooh, it is. So yeah, and and it's jeopardy every day. And then like you see an injury like Joe Burrow, and you're like Jalen Ramsey, and you're just sort of like cancel practice for the rest of the season. Exactly. We're good. Just we're don't, ready. Don't even step on the field. We're we're, <laughs> we're, just, good. we're good now. We're let's uh, let's get ready for week one. Um. So yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting dan- dynamic, and and you know. Uh, if Joe Burrow is potentially out for the season, like you, part of you sitting there going, well, that makes it easier for Browns. I don't want guys to get hurt. I certainly don't exactly. want the bad juju then of that to be like, oh, great. The Browns are going to have the division and then something will inevitably happen. Okay. We've been, we've been there before. We can't think that we can't. So, think that. but yeah, uh, look, roster still needs work. I think, I think they still need a couple of positions, but ultimately I feel pretty good about where we're at. Uh, injuries could change that development, all that. We'll see where they go, but I feel, you know, I'll be cautiously optimistic at this point, uh, t- to borrow from Bree, that we we are in a state of cautious optimism until we get to the regular season. And hopefully if we're all healthy, then it will be in unbridled enthusiasm if they come out <laughs> and play well, week well. Give me uh, until September, okay? Yes. Well, that's fine. I mean, we got lots of time. Uh, anyway, if you want to help us out, obviously, like, subscribe to the YouTube channel. That's been great. Tell a friend, all those good things. You know, we had a, I think... Two whole people were really excited for us to come back. So I was going to say, I, I I just figured everyone forgot about us, which is fine. There was a, a tepid demand for us to come back. So we answered <laughs> that demand. We are back. We should be back next week. Hopefully continue to roll into the season now that we are through the 
greatest seven year old uh seven year old baseball slash football career in history this past summer hopefully he can build on it next year but for the moment we're clear and ready to go for for brown season which i'm sure he's super excited for anyway uh but we will be back next week so yeah thanks for listening and uh keep keep an eye out we'll, we'll be ready to go